I, I experienced those soccer baptisms. And there was one week in particular that my companion and I, we didn't baptize. And and she it was like devastating for her, you know, to be to be removed from that. Did not, did not respect my no at all, at all. And just, you know, leaned in and just kissed me. And, mm-hmm. and, and I was saying no to it. I was like, no, like, don't and did. Welcome back to the Mormon History Hoedown. My name is Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuanto, and sometimes I have fascinating guests come on into my studio and tell me some really interesting stories from their life, their mission, and we talk about important topics that have to do with just our post-Mormon life and growth journey. So welcome to the Mormon History Hoedown, Susie. Hello. Hey, Suze. Hey. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on in. So uh, for a little bit of an overview about what we're going to be talking about today, Susie was telling me that she has some really interesting stories that she's never told anyone um, from her mission um, (laughs) that deal with some some topics that honestly have not really been covered a whole lot in the ex-Mormon space. So I don't know of any interview, whether I was at Mormon Stories or not, that deals with when sister missionaries and elders have romantic relationships on their missions. And that is something that Susie big reveal wanted to talk about it. She has never talked about publicly before. And um, I was listening to your interview with Mormons on mushrooms last mm-hmm. night with Doug and Mike, who are fantastic. And you kind of skipped over that part where you're like, my mission, <laughs> that was its own movie. And I'm like, well, let's sell that script right now. <laughs> let's let's talk about all of that. And we're going to get into uh, ideas about consent and shame and what it is like to be in a romantic slash kind of sexual relationship on your mission as a, a sister missionary. And your companion, you mentioned, was also in a relationship with that other person what your zone leaders yes companion as well yes and uh, two sisters two zone leaders a pact that you said you were gonna take to the grave we did yes until today um so yeah this is this is a a big share i am so honored yeah yeah i think i think it's an important share you know these themes of consent and shame these are emotions and feelings that when raised mormon and when um especially on a mission these themes come up a lot and i i just hope that this share you know like i said i haven't i haven't shared it before but i hope um my hope for this share is just to make anyone who has experienced feelings like that feel, you know, seen and feel like it's okay because I went on my mission in 2010. I came back in 2012. So it's been a really long time. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and I've never shared it. And and I, you know, I stepped out of practicing Mormonism in 20. I guess that my like my full exit was 2016. So yeah, and I still haven't shared it. So there, there's a lot there. You know, there's a lot that you carry um, even as you leave these systems. Um sure. and and that that maybe had you feeling oppressed and and even after that, it, you carry it with you for a long time. So for anyone out there, for those people who have experienced feeling similar to that or or still are carrying that i just hope the share makes them feel less bad because mm-hmm. feeling bad is not helpful in the human um journey in my experience it's, it's mm-hmm. not very helpful and i really i also really believe in stories and i really believe in um sharing those stories so thank you for um for facilitating a platform for that yeah it's important. Yeah. So hopefully you guys just come on this journey with us and we can go ahead and jump right into it. We met through um, a mutual friend, mm-hmm. through Tanner of Zelf on the Shelf, and who does fantastic work. I've always wanted to know more about your story, how you got into doing the work that you're doing right now. Susie has um, a really, fan- like really interesting career in what you do 
in kind of plant medicine space and things like that, Mm -hmm. that we're going to kind of get into at the end. Hung out with Susie a little bit this weekend at this conference called uh, Psychedelics in the Beehive. A lot of people are curious about you know, whether they're Mormon, ex Mormon, mm-hmm. there's so many people who are curious about that kind of stuff. Tell me about kind of what led up to you yeah. and the mission story, and as much as you want to get into <laughs> about this romantic relationship and yeah. the highs, the lows. Yeah, well, places. I guess I would. I would like to start with. I've always been a a spiritual person in the sense that I feel lucky and blessed that I. It's it hasn't been hard. Um, you know, different different levels. Sometimes it's been very hard, but generally speaking throughout my life, even um, from a young child, that has not been the most difficult thing to feel connected, you know, like through nature or through art or through family or at church, you know, I've, I've, I've been able to feel um, for myself. I don't know how else to describe it, but um, connected. That's a blessing for me, you know, just to have those those moments of like uh, feeling kind of like one with like your surroundings and Mm -hmm. whatever's going on with you. And, and I always, you know, I always felt that in my family, I feel really, really lucky to have um, the best family in my opinion and, Mm -hmm. um, and really supportive parents who um, encouraged us to explore nature and, and travel. And that was, that was very helpful. I was born in Utah, um, lived here till I was four. My dad was at BYU, um, lived here till I was four. And then we moved around a ton. We, um, moved all over, left, um, did his residency fellowships, all that. So we, you know, we followed him around and there's Mm -hmm. seven of us. So like it was all of us, you know, in this like, pack we call ourselves the wolf pack because there i have seven siblings and we're all like still very close which i'm yeah i'm really grateful for yeah so we were mormon in florida in georgia and missouri and but mostly alabama is where i grew up like on the florida border and um like deep in the bible belt so um church was always for me church was always like home like especially my ward shout out to my ward that i grew up Mm -hmm. in in alabama like real family stuff you Mm -hmm. know like we were all it was it was a beautiful community and i always thought that our church was true (laughs) less because of because i never like read the book of mormon or anything like that less because of like the doctrinal stuff but because we had church dances that's why I thought our church was true. We're just cooler than the other people. It was more fun. Yeah. Like I really value fun and I, I'm a very like extroverted social person and I love dancing. And I was like also surrounded by a lot of um, kind of kind of Bible bashing, like um, evangelical and, and they don't a lot of a lot of the religions that I grew up with, they, they don't believe in dancing at all. So, um, actually my two best friends, I had a Catholic best friend and a Jewish best friend. And we were like the freaking outcast because the Mormon, the Jew and the Catholic and in the South, walk it's into like, into a bar. Yeah, exactly. Walk into, walk into a church dance. I wasn't rude. Like we are the true church, but it was like, this is what I believe. This is what my family does. And like, come at me. I'm, I'm here for it. And, and I think people respected it, you know, and my, we were all very like diverse too. Like my brothers were in a death metal band <laughs> that they started. And um, I only, I can only speak for my experience. So like, you know, as these things, they were true for me for a long time. Now they're not true for me anymore. For me, that's, I, I, you know, this is just my journey. This is just what has been true. Hasn't been, has worked, hasn't for me. I honor the practices and paths that, that all humans are taking that, are helpful for them because mm-hmm. I can't know that. Yeah, you know, that's literally what I say. Yeah, I just yeah. got asked the other night on a live stream. Somebody was like, "I heard you once say, Kara, that uh, that like everyone should leave the church all the time, and then also it's like you know do what you want." And I was like, "I I feel like I've been pretty consistent, like yeah. that um like I understand um different perspectives and stuff, but I I 
I mean, first Mormon stories interview, I've always tried to be like, I really haven't walked in everyone's shoes. Right. And I don't know what the How pillars I are know? Yeah. That, that keep like your life, your mental health together, exactly. your family together. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to talk and to explore these ideas. Overall, the nuance I love is where this is going. So <laughs> keep going. Cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, I, as, as like a teen to, I mean, it was, it was just, again, it was a great landing pad. It was, it was, my word was my family. It was my community. It was, it was lovely. And, and I never, ever thought I would go on a mission ever because like also back then, like you had to be 21 and it was not cute to go on a mission as a girl. Like, no, that's not what you do. After high school in Alabama, I went off to Provo, the motherland. I went to hair school and, um, and ended up loving it surprisingly because I was not expecting to enjoy that career path, but it has served me very well. Did everyone um, just walk in and say, uh, Susie, I want whatever your hair is doing. Uh, <laughs> um, back then, I don't think so. That was like 2007 when that like weird fucking like side part and like swoop. Do you remember that? Yeah, like, I had you part it. Insert pictures of me, right? Yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. Within like I did, I did a year and a half of hair school in Provo um ended up doing an apprenticeship in New York City like pretty quick after hair school I also just like hated Utah um growing up in the south I was just like this is weird like Provo's yeah. weird and this is weird and this is not for me and so and also I just like I I got into you know doing hair I liked the art of it and I wanted to learn more and like master the craft so I found a really great stylist to apprentice under in in Manhattan, um, shout out Alan. I did not come in to the like I was scared of certain things, but other things I was just like ready to like explore life. Um, explore. You can go out there and grab the yeah. world and and make your way in it. Yes, whether yes. Mormon or not, where you're just very intimidated by the world. Yeah, where I don't think you like that. That well, would never be intimidating. You know? No, I, I I didn't give the shout out to my mom too because she really supported that. My mom's a really strong woman. And, and she was the reason that I moved to New York at mm -hmm. that time. I was like, you know, none of us had ever been like mm -hmm. my mom's from Georgia. And like, but I was like, mom, I like, I need, I feel like I need to live in New York. She's like, okay, I'll, I'll take it. I set up like interviews and we went and my mom like facilitated this whole, it's interesting you know, New York that your family time. wasn't worried that you would be like going to the big city and going to leave the church they weren't. behind. No, they weren't. No. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't at all. And I, I linked pretty quickly with the YSA in in the Upper West Side YSA. That's the um, young single adult ward. Yeah, which they can be really fun. In it a, was in a city with like people who are out there probably doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of creatives, a lot of like really interesting professionals. Um, and I was like by far the youngest. I moved in with like I want to say like four or five girls um so I just it felt a little too like I was like I'm not like really in New York I just feel like I'm kind of in like mini Provo oh, in a way in the Upper yeah. West Side and and I was like young I don't know I was wanting like a grittier experience um so vivant bros knocking on my for sure yeah <laughs> I was like not into it and so I was like I'm moving to Brooklyn at the time I was not, I, I was, I was doing the kind of like I always had, I was doing the Mormon thing because it provided really solid community and it, it provided like a really great, um, you know, landing pad for me. And I was also like exploring on my own. I had a fake ID. I would go out, I would, you know, whatever is such an interesting place, but obviously has a very dark side to it. I think I leaned into that at a young age, like in a way that kind of like freaked me out a little bit. And I was like, whoo, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to really just like depend on this community. And I loved the, the small branch that I was in, in Brooklyn. It was just like this really beautiful. Like I was um, one of like two white girls in the branch. It felt very authentic and real. And people were like real Christians there too. Like it didn't feel like a Mormon church mm -hmm. either, to be honest. Like, well, it is a Mormon church, but like in the way that I knew it, you know, like mm -hmm. in the, in the congregations that I had been involved mm -hmm. in, it just didn't feel like that. Yeah. Like sure there were like a lot more just like ethnically diverse. It was diverse. Like it was immigrants and, and people who yeah. bring in their cultures as opposed to just like white and, bread Mormons. <laughs> yeah. A place where people could practice spirituality together and, and there was no, there was no shame or there was no like, this is how you do it. My boss at the time he was like well you know the next step is like you're gonna be your own stylist be on the floor build your clientele work here 
And I was like, I'm not ready for my career. Like I want to adventure. I want to like explore. I've always loved traveling. And I was like, I want to, maybe I should, I'm going to go on a mission. I I was in the salon watching him do a haircut and I was like, I need to go on a mission. And then, and, and that was that I had a really interesting experience with my branch president at the time, who was like an amazing guy. And we met and all I said was just like, you know, I, I was like, I don't know if I'm even allowed. Cause like, there's so you can't have had sex and you can't have, there's like so many rules to this thing I've heard, <laughs> but like, I, I, I want to go on a mission. He's like, you're fine. You can go and you're going to go to Brazil. And I was like, oh, whoa, that's weird and random. He was Brazilian. And he was Brazilian. And so yeah. I, I kind of thought that I was like, well, maybe because he's Brazilian. He's and my dad went to Brazil and I'm like, they're kind of rooting for that. And then when I got my call, because back then you had to like turn in the little like um, actual photo of you. And and I remember I heard some like wives tale, like make it the ugliest picture. If you want to go foreign, make it the ugliest picture of you possible. So the like won't send you to Temple Square because I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to like be in the grid of it. I tried to take the most hideous picture. I think <laughs> I'd I love succeeded. to see that picture. <laughs> I would too, actually. I wonder where that picture is now. Um, and I, yeah, and then I got called to Brazil. So I was like, oh my, oh my gosh, look, this is crazy. This is true. Is true. Yeah. And my parents were like pretty surprised too. That's kind of like a fun note. They're like, what? You're leaving New York that you love? Because I really loved it. New York is kind of a spiritual home for me. And and they're like, well, okay. I mean, my parents are great, but I think they were really like, you're going to kind of give up your career and like, good for you. Like, awesome. But wow, like surprised, you know? Looking back, what were like the motivations you think you really wanted to serve a mission? I think I wanted to go travel. Also, the branch really inspired me. The people that I met there, it felt like real humanity in a way that I hadn't like experienced growing up in, you know, racist Alabama and growing up in like <laughs> yeah. white Mormons, you know. And, and so the branch was really like, oh, this is like what's real. And and the context and the the container for that was Mormonism. So I was like, I want to I want to keep interacting with that um, human to human, you know, sh sharing space with each other and like bearing each other's burdens, like all those like real Christian values I felt in that congregation in Brooklyn. And so I, I think it was like the travel part, but also like, I want to do more of this. Like I want to do mm. more service, honestly, like I'm young and I don't care about like building some career. I'm like 21. I want to do something. And um, something meaningful. And, and I felt like that would be that, you know, mm -hmm. I felt I really did. And, and so, yeah, yeah. So, so I went and, um, yeah, packed my bags. That was crazy. And, um, and fun, fun note that will, that will, uh, play into the story later. But before, before I left on my mission, my dad did give me a blessing that, and in the blessing, he did say, that through my mission efforts that I would find my eternal companion. Mormonism, you know, like as far as the doctrine goes, like to get to the the highest, to ex experience exaltation and to be with God again, you have to be married. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big piece of the whole doctrine. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of the doctrine, because like it's been a while since I've cracked no, that's the book. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and so like and and as and so I'm like, oh, like this is, you know, coming from from my dad. And it's so funny because like even to this day, like my my mom, she's like after the book, she's like, Why why'd you say that? <laughs> like and he's like, Well, you know, it just kind of came out and you know, the whole the whole thing there with I don't know it because I never had the priesthood, so I don't know how Why that goes. Why they feel like saying those things? Yeah, I'll never but. know. So that was kind of like in my mind. Ooh, where's my husband? A little bit, you know, because it was like, well, like my dad said that, like I trust him, and and I trust in the priesthood, and so well, I guess I'll run into him, mm -hmm. <laughs> like on this mission, and that holds a lot of sway. It holds in a lot your of sway. Little what twenty one year old mind, right? Right. I mean, I was able to learn the language, and like that's crazy that that happens. How's your so Portuguese quickly. now, dude? It's actually like surprisingly good. I had a Lyft driver yesterday oh, yeah. that I was telling you yeah, about dude. that was born in Portugal, but he went on a mission in Brazil and he, we were speaking Portuguese the whole time and it was like, felt really good. It felt so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, what's nice about 
kind of viewing life and all of these things when you're able to kind of understand and work through the reasons why you did the things and the yeah. situations you were in as part of a journey and be able to to kind of pass off that that trauma there's so many things with this post-mormon journey and yeah. then you can separate and take the pieces that you like you're like that's great that i learned some important lessons mm-hmm. i learned things about myself and i learned a second language and stuff so totally. it's nuanced it is yeah. like it, if you can work really through it is. yeah you can see yeah like, the positive things sometimes mm-hmm. yeah yeah, and I'm an optimist too. I, I better just like me too. put that out there. <laughs> not for better to, not or for worse. To, I was about to say, I was like, not to my benefit necessarily. Yeah, it's just like how my <laughs> brain's wired. And then and then finally made it pr- to Brazil. And it was just like, oh, like I I had never been to South America. I it was just white people were were just so we can be so clunky, <laughs> like in our like in our um ways of interacting, and especially like I felt like at least in within Mormon. It can be so awkward you know and like Brazilians are not awkward like at least like the majority of the ones I met or what I felt like the vibe there is just people know how to be cool and I loved that I was like I immediately fell in love like with the place the people the vibe like it's it's just it was it was different and I I loved it and I I had um I had Brazilian companions and and I'm I'm the type of person too like if I'm going to do something like I'm going to do it and I'm going to and so like with with Brazil it was like I'm here I'm not one of those missionaries that's like oh like I still want to like I got to find the one grocery store with peanut butter because Brazil doesn't have peanut butter it was like no like I will be eating rice and beans every day I will I I do Commit. love it yeah like it was this like I will become Brazilian. Like if you do go on a mission or spend time in another country that is not your own, learn and listen and and try to, you know, really like watch um how how these different people live their lives. And and I always found that really interesting, like some anthropological part of myself that mm-hmm. Um, I find just fascinating. And so that was also just something I was just so interested in all the differences. And it, it's just harder to like convert Americans who have gone to college. No offense, but like that's, I mean, we are entering, you know, a third world country and and things are very different. And now I see that. I didn't, I didn't see that then um, as well, but I did, I didn't immediately upon arriving note the difference and like, oh, wow, these missionaries like, um, are very aggressive with their, these like male and female, both missionaries I I noticed were very aggressive with their, um, converting styles and their goals for baptizing people. And that felt really wrong to me. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it was a a numbers thing? Absolutely. Yeah. And that felt so wrong. And I didn't care. I've, you know, I I didn't care that I disagreed on that. I said, no. Like, I remember specifically, I had one companion who, um, this is, this is kind of in the beginning, I think probably three, four months into being in Brazil. I, I had my first, like, well, maybe she's my second um, American companion, but um, amazing, amazing person. Um, love this woman. And and she had baptized every week for, I forget how many weeks, but that was a thing in the mission. Like on our, on our weekly, um, you know, updates or when we would sign in to be able to email our families once a week, we would also see the two missionaries that had baptized for the most consecutive weeks. And she was one of those. And we became companions and I, there was one week where we didn't have someone to baptize and I didn't give a shit because that's not why I was there. You know, like I, and I think people knew that about me pretty quick when I got there. I was like, I don't care. Like if someone wants to get baptized and that will help Mm -hmm. them, I'm all about that. Yeah. As opposed to like, um, I'm guessing when you sit down in like your different meetings and it's like, let's set a baptismal goal for this date. Is that what you mean by like? We're going to set a date for you to get baptized. We're working towards that. Yeah. What was your approach versus? I would do that. No, that was definitely it. It just, I wouldn't manipulate people if they did not want to get baptized. If I, if I had a, if, if we had someone we were teaching and I could tell, you know, that they, it, they didn't want to, or they didn't know what they were, they didn't know what they were doing. There were certain missionaries, um, that would, and, and mostly in leadership positions, in in my experience that would see that and say 
Okay. And then they would manipulate, you know, well, come play soccer with us on this day. Come, you know, like really doing everything in their power to baptize this person that is giving um, clear signals, in my opinion, that they weren't interested, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, and on that, that soccer note, um, you didn't know this, the very first episode of Mormon stories was John DeLynn talking about some of the things that started to accumulate on his shelf that started on his mission, which I believe was in Guatemala. Yeah. And, yeah. and then like Tanner from self on the shelf, he talked about that as well. Like the numbers really bothering him and right, not feeling right. like people were doing things for the right reasons. And right. John's first episode was about like writing to church leaders saying Interesting, all these yeah. baseball baptisms and soccer baptisms right. were going on where they tell the <laughs> yeah. kids to come in yeah. and we're going to play a game. We have yeah. this, this league and then we're all going to go get dunked in the yeah. thing later just yeah. to get their numbers. So out. I don't need to retell that story. Everyone yeah. knows that story, but I didn't know that, you know, like as a young Mormon girl, I didn't know that was the vibe, you know, yeah. like I really thought. Yeah, it's especially, shocking. Yeah, especially kind of coming. Your bubble. Yeah, and I think for all of us, you know, like you're saying, like Tanner and John and everything, like, yes, I, I experienced those soccer baptisms. And there was one week in particular that my companion and I, we didn't baptize. And and she, it was like devastating for her, you know, to be to be removed from that. But it got pretty weird. Like it was a young man who we had been teaching. He wasn't ready to get baptized. And our zone leaders um, at the time were like, you know, who do you have? We got to keep you on the streak to my companion. You know, she was my senior companion at the time. We got to keep you on this baptismal streak. Who do you have to teach? Who do you, who? And we're like, well, we have this one guy, but he doesn't want to, you know, like he, he, he doesn't, he's not interested. He's made that like pretty clear. Well, the leaders, they found someone to go pick him up. We bring him to the church. No one is at the church. The church is closed. We unlock the church. It's me and my companion, two leaders. And the, I forget what that um, calling is, but it's like a guy in the ward who's like the missionary liaison kind of person. Ward mission leader. Ward maybe? mission leader. Yeah. And him. And it was um, it was the five of us, five versus one Brazilian man who was like 19 years old. And he was kind of like laughing because he was like, I'm not going to get baptized tonight. And our zone leader was like, we can do it right now. Trying to spin up a baptism <laughs> that day. No one's there, you know, and it was just, it was off and it was weird. Yeah, and which is super common, super common, you know, and, and I think it was really good for my companion to experience that, like wait, this isn't worth, like dunking this guy who doesn't want to be baptized is not worth my streak, you know? But you're so, you're just so brainwashed that like for her, she's doing her best. Like she's she's doing the job that she set out to do. Yeah. That's like what we're supposed to do, you know? And and she was a, a performer. I mean, uh, this is a common thing, but you, they call you machines on on the mission. That's like a very common little nickname for the missionaries is like, we're all machines here. And it's like, I'm not a part of this machine. I, I didn't care. I, that was like, I think that was a, a big turning point. I think it was probably, yeah, like three or four months into Brazil. And it was just like, yeah, not doing that for me. Like I'll stay out here and I'll, I'll do this because I love being here. I love these people and I feel connected to God and, and I'll stay out here, but I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> That's not for me. And so I, you know, I, it was great. Like I, I felt like I, you know, um, met a lot of wonderful people. I learned a lot from the people in that country. I feel really like honored to have been able to like share space with, with those people down there. And, um, and baptism was not my goal (laughs) at all. Yeah. And it sounds like it, there, I'm going to go on a small rant. So I like how you kind of introduced going on a mission to talk about like the community aspect and what the culture was like for you. And then seeing that in this, the branch that you were in New York City. And there is what I hope people understand who are, you know, either Mormon, ex-Mormon, never been Mormon, is that like you in in yourself and I would say like in myself and in so many good people within the church who leave it as well. It's like they do have this type of like Christ consciousness that everyone in different religions are trying to tap into. And yeah. it's going to be expressed within, like you said, this container. And then you kind of butt up against this um, 
systemic issues and problems of how missions are run, how the church is run. And that's where, like I was telling you before we started, like where my sister was at when she left Mm. the church after she she served a mission, like really having the bubble burst of like how I want to love and serve people in Mm. this container and seeing that the system is really holding you back from that. that. And like who I'm supposed to be looking up to and these leaders and things who supposedly have more power in the priesthood. And it just doesn't feel like they're in tune with the type of like God that I want to worship, but Mm -hmm. you're still in the system going through the motions they tell you and the hoops they tell you to jump through. And then you are jumping. the spiritual friction that kind of starts to come up and has nothing to do with the truth claims of what Joseph Smith did, you know? Right, right. It's just this disconnect with what your best ideals of Jesus Christ and what you understand that is so ubiquitous in all kinds of spiritual practices. It, it, in this, what I call a Rocky Mountain Bible fan fiction sex cult, (laughs) it just has so many other influential factors. It's just difficult to express that. And I think a lot of people wake up to that on their mission, especially in third world countries and people who are poor paying tithing to this church. Right. Yeah. Hard not to, hard not to. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so from from there, you know, I had I, I was in different areas and then I pretty much just had Brazilian companions after that. And I believe I after her, I became a, the like senior companion. And I ended up in an area that I was opening with a new missionary um, and she is was, you know, just like a, an actual sister to me. A beautiful Brazilian woman. And this particular area, we were very far away from the city center where our, where the um, mission president was. This area had been closed. So there had not been missionaries in this particular part of the country in a, I want to say a long time. So we're like entering into this new apartment that hadn't been lived in in a long time, you know, owned by the church. And and we're like getting to know the members of the congregation who hadn't had missionaries in a really long time. And the place was just beautiful. It was like um, on the beach, you know, it was just like a, a beautiful place, first mm-hmm. of all, you know. And, and one thing that I love about Brazilians is they just like, they just make the most of life and they make the most of of what's in front of them and around them. And they're just real like, um, connoisseurs of life and like appreciate life. And I love that. And, and, um, especially being with like, uh, having a Brazilian companion and, and like seeing it through that lens and she was particularly special. And, um, yeah, we had a great, we had a great time at this point. I had been on my mission for, um, a year and, and like I said before, um, so I have someone very close to me in my life who I won't speak on their behalf, but who was, um, sent home early from their mission for breaking certain rules. And I watched this person, um, I watched this person struggle really, really immensely. And this person's really close to me. And I, I saw that happen before I went on my mission and I saw, I saw it like, you know, destroy, uh, this person's spirit and, and really, um, affect, the the family and and I just thought like I will never do that you know I won't I won't put my family through that I won't I won't put myself through that I won't Mm -hmm. break rules I won't get sent home Mm -hmm. because I saw how damaging that was like like really bad and I will not like that was just like a no won't do it so yeah that I, I think that's important to note too that was a very I was just I will not get sent home I know what that does and I I won't I won't do that And so I had been, when we got to this area, I'd been out for a year. I had six more months left on my mission and we, it was all new. Like it was all so new for my companion and I, we are zone leaders. So like the way it works, I'm sure everyone knows this, but for anyone who doesn't, um, you know, you have like different little, almost like pods. And in ours, I think there were like six of us kind of in, in, our district, you know, and then you have a leader of that district and then more districts, you have like a zone and then you have two leaders um, ahead of that. And so our zone leaders, so they're kind of like our connection to the president of the mission too. It's all very like, you know, hierarchical uh, right. trickle down system and, um, and women can never be in those uh, positions by the way. So our zone leaders met us at lunch. We'd been there like two days in this new, um, beautiful place. We're excited. We're ready to go. Um, and, and our zone leaders meet us and two Brazilian guys, 
um, seem cool, seem helpful, seem excited, seem, you know, ready to go. And, and yeah, didn't, I didn't think much of it. Um, and, and then it was about like a week or two after that, my, my companion, um, you know, she's like, I need to, I need to tell you something. And, and I'm like, what? She's like, she's like, I, I'm in love with one of the zone leaders. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And, and I thought it was funny at first, honestly, I was like, okay, first of all, like you're a new missionary, you're young, like it makes sense. You're homesick. Like you're not in love, you know, like we, we haven't dated. You're probably missing dating because hello, like we haven't done that and we're not going to do that until like we get home. And so like, no, you're not in love. And I kind of like, I feel bad. I kind of like dismissed her feelings, you know? And she was like, no, I am in love. Like, I know that I'm going to marry this guy. And I was like, you met him once. Like, how can you know that? That's not, no, no. And, and it was one of our zone leaders. And I was like, and we were really close. Her and I were, were really close to, and I was just like, there's, there's, there's no way, you know? And, and she was like, please like, you know, don't tell anyone. And I'm like, I won't, of course not. Like, I'm not going to tell anyone. She's like, don't tell president. Cause that's the, we do interviews with the president too. And you're supposed to like come clean with anything going on. And, and that's always risky because it could send you home, you know? So it's always this, like, it's tricky. And, and I'm like, I'm not going to like tell anyone, but like, you know, it's nothing and just don't do anything too. I remember like telling her like, don't do anything about it, but like, it's fine to have a crush, but mm -hmm. you know. And just for listeners who, uh, I assume most people are pretty familiar that Mormon missions are extremely strict with, you know, you being home at a certain time, being to bed, waking up at a certain time and cataloging your days and what you did and um, making sure that you're always doing the lessons that you're supposed to be doing, proselytizing, mm -hmm. and you don't have a lot of free time to do anything. So dating is completely like spending any free time, pretty much doing anything yeah. that you really want to well, do. Well, and, and dating is just, it is, it is so, it is so bad dating on your, like, it's just the number one no-no. Like you will get sent home, you know, any, any romantic kind of, unless you, it's one thing if you tell the president like early on, hey, I have feeling they'll transfer you and say, okay, well, whatever. Like, thanks for telling me, transfer you, you know. But um, but actually, yeah, it is, and it's it's just the at least when I was, I don't know how it is mm -hmm. now, but like at least when I was there, it was very serious, a very serious no. And you're also conditioned to always be honest in your dealings yes. with your fellow men. That's part of the temple recommend question. Absolutely. And not only are, are you obviously like committing to serve this mission, but you have some serious shame of keeping a secret yeah. if you do have these kinds of feelings right. and letting people down. Right. So you're really it. conditioned to like tell the truth. And then All if you're it. not truthful with it, I'm sure right. that leads to a whole heap of problems. But then also coming from my personal experience of like, I will not get sent home. I will not put my mom through that. Sure. You know, it's just like this whole... So anyways, um, she tells me that we go to our next, I think it was like our next zone meeting. Because you don't see these people often either because, um, you know, you're all in your own respective areas and you're all hopefully, it's, you know, for the church, you're doing work and you're focused. And I think it was like our next zone meeting after that or something. Um, the, the, we were all there. So it's probably like, I don't know, like 12 missionaries all together or whatever, <laughs> like socializing, doing like normal, healthy things for like young people in their early twenties to do all the missionaries are there, like whatever. And I remember the, the elder, um, the like senior zone leader came up to me and he's like, he like pulled me aside and he's like, Hey, like what's going on? Like with our companions. And I was like, what do you mean? Cause I, I told her I wouldn't like tell anyone or say anything. And he's like, well, he's like, you know, my, my companion's like in love with your companion. And I was like, Oh, that I was like, Oh, like he told you that. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Like he's like, he's like in love with her. And I was like, Oh my God, like, so is mine. Like that's so have they talked? He's like, I don't even think they've talked. And so immediately it was this really like, Oh, whoa. Like, and, and I trusted him. I also like trusted in the priesthood and trusted in the leadership. 
at this point still. And I was like, well, should we like tell, you know, I, I remember asking him at that point, I was like, you're the leader in this scenario. Should we tell, like, should we tell the president about this? And, um, and because like, what if it gets out of hand? I don't want, and he's like, no, 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 no. Like, definitely not. Like, let's not tell. It'll be fine. We'll keep it cool and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But your instinct was my instinct was like tell but then then you know we were also really good friends and they're falling in love and and it was like we'll, we'll all get separated we'll yeah. all get you know well, immediately you, you said you're close friends exactly so. she was my sister is you know like we were so close and so i was like no i don't i want to be with her till the end of my like she's my bestie my you know like and yeah i i didn't know and so he was like no because it'll like you know, he'll, no, we don't need to, it's not necessary. And he was also on, it's a career path ladder too, that you're climbing within the church as a man. Like he wanted to be assistant to the president, obviously. So like, which is like the most revered thing that you could ever be on a mission as a boy. Girls could know. I don't know. Maybe girls can do it now, but back then girls couldn't yeah. do it. I love Mormon culture and yeah. at the same time, but like that is an introduction that boys make after they get back from their missions. They're like, uh put it in their dating profile yeah yeah exactly <laughs> stuff like that and so this guy i knew that that was his path i knew that's where he was trying to go um and he was like you know that will uh, he's like that'll like mess up uh, well i don't think he came out and like said that but it was clear that's why he didn't want to tell anything because it would make him look like he didn't have things under control mm -hmm. you know and he would he would get demoted i'm sure or additionally want to have his own um love and romantic relationship so well him and i were friends at this point that like um senior elder we were friends and he was engaged he was engaged to someone that he had baptized before the mission and and our district all became like really close like we would do p day p day is like the one day off when you can like play sports or what did we even do on like um lame stuff but you don't you're not doing missionary work so you can like hang out with the other missionaries and whatever and so yeah him and i him and i were friends and and i forget how much time went by but like some time passed and and we were just sort of keeping the secret for our companions and you just know? to clarify had the your companion and his companion had they really just like love at first sight it was the first time they met yeah and they really hadn't had any really prior hadn't. contact no that's no, crazy. really People crazy. Felt it. Yeah, really, really like special, you know, and, and nothing happened between them either. Like they would, I mean, they would talk and they would, there would be like googly eyes happening and we were just, we would just kind of laugh. Me and like the senior zone leader were like, oh, wow, like, uh, but like nothing's going to happen here. Everything's fine, you know, like whatever. There's this one day where we all, you know, take a bus ride we all went to do like a, the the whole group of everyone we go do like a group adventure like for for the district naturally because those two were pairing off him and i just kind of paired off and as as friends and he would he would vent a lot about his um his fiance who was waiting for him and how it was hard and how he didn't really know if she was the right one for him but you know he had bad so he's like opening up to me you know and like as women or I can only speak for me, but you know, I'm, I'm like, Oh, like honored to like, you know, hold space for him and listen and like be there for him and da da da. And somehow along the way he had found out, I don't know if my companion told him or what, but somehow he had found out about the blessing that my dad gave me before the mission. Oh, no way. Somehow. I still like don't really know exactly how he, he found out about so that. He found out that before you left on your mission, your dad gave you a father's blessing so that you would find your eternal companion yeah. to make it to the celestial kingdom. I would find it through my mission through efforts. Mission. And I was at like six months. So it was kind of in the, and I wasn't interested in like, dating i was really just happy to be there and i was loving my mission and um sure. but and so that wasn't really on my mind at this point at all you know i was just like just happy to be there and and but somehow he had found out so anyways like i, I don't remember the exact amount of time but it had to be like over like weeks you know all this is sort of happening building and then one day he calls me this is after we have this like long group um, P day where we're all just like hanging out together that night. 
he calls and only the like senior um, companions can hold, have the phone. It's like a privilege that only the like senior companions really weird. So I have the phone. He has the phone, of course. So he, he calls me and he's like, Hey, um, you know, and, and mind you all these, these are all three. I'm the only American in this scenario. Um, my companion is Brazilian. The two zone leaders are Brazilian. And, um, and he calls me and, and he's like, he's like, Hey, you know, I need to, we need to talk about something like really serious. You know, there's, there's something that, um, that I need to tell you. I need you to like prepare for this. And, and it's, it's very serious. So like, call me back when you're ready. And I was like, that seems weird. And so I remember like kind of talking to my companion about it. And I was like, what do you think it is? Do you think it's like something with the mission? Like, I wonder, cause at this point, like all four of us were just like really good friends too. You know, I was like, what do you think's going on with him? Like, what does he need to talk to me about? And then, um, and I call him back and that night, cause she was, she was just, she's so sweet and, and she's just so supportive and anything. And so she's like, well, why don't you just find out? I don't, I don't know, but you know, be, be open to whatever it may be. Like they are our leaders. Um, we trust them and, you know, they're here to like help us. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, totally, totally. So I call him back and <laughs> on the phone, he's like, um, I am in love with you. I'm in love with you. And we are going to get married. Yes, we are going to get married. And that's the whole reason that we like came on this mission is to meet each other and get married. And, and my first reaction truly was like, you're insane. I was mad. I was really mad at first. I was like, you have a fiance. Um, this is immature. This is stupid. Um, no, absolutely not. Like, no. And then he says, you know, I understand this reaction is like very normal because like, of course, like this is against the rules and like, of course, all of that. But, um, you know, I want you to pray about it tonight. Truly says that I want you to pray about it. And I want you to really like with an open heart and an open mind, you know, just pray and like ask like if this is like real and, and, you know, because I we're supposed to get married. Like we're going to get married. I'm like, well, this is like something that we ask people that we're trying to convert. Like we ask them to pray and ask about these things to know for themselves if they're true. So like, okay. So I get off the phone. Into it. Kind of. Yeah. And I get off the phone and then my companion, she's like, well, you should like, that's always the, you know, we always pray to know and drinking that Kool-Aid. And, and she's like, you know, maybe you should, maybe you should like heed his advice. And I'm like, okay, they are our leaders. You know, ultimately we do trust them. They know, not us. They have the priesthood. And so it just, it just slowly over that evening. And then I did, I prayed about it. I'm like, please help me know. Cause like, I want to, I want to do the right thing, putting all these pieces together. And I kid you not, I wake up the next day and I'm in full love with this guy. Like I, something happened. Just like birds and rainbows. Birds and, and rainbows. Really? And I like call him and I'm like, hey, like, yeah, I knew that would happen. Whoa. Yes. Oh, yes. And I'm like, like, this is so exciting. Like I met my husband. For real. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> so funny actually but i have i haven't like i said i haven't ever told this story like like this before so it's yeah. hilarious to like go through the like steps yeah. and details and just like see how comical it really is yeah. um because there's a lot of obviously dating culture within mormonism that people need to get married and yes like you know you go spend your whole life looking for your eternal companion byu yes by spring it's why MRS you're degree. here yeah all of that especially as a woman yeah. And so that, that uh, nobody would be surprised whether Christian culture or Mormon culture that that's there. But then this like pressure cooker that you're also under in a mission um, where you're horny AF, you <laughs> aren't able to, to date. But then, like you said, the, the priesthood that's over you. Yeah. That, kind of can that you trust. You into yes. Believing in their feelings more than your own. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And then just like riding that, tra like jumping on that train and just like riding it and thinking that it's your own, you know, it's just like the ultimate giving up your authority and your exactly. power. And after that, we, I think we were all together for like one transfer, but it was very like, there's rules. Like we won't have sex. We won't, 
we uh, had to actually like we did say, the four of us we would make never sure we have sex yeah <laughs> and tried to hold each other you know accountable and keep each other like safe from like breaking too many rules like we were breaking rules but mm-hmm. we weren't gonna like break all the rules you know and these weird like mental gymnastics that we were like playing with each other and ourselves and to stay safe. But very early on, we said like, we will not tell anyone about this, you know, because this will send us home at this point. We're in too deep and like, mm, like this is it. So in your typical mission schedule of what you're supposed to be doing as a missionary, were you guys taking off a lot of time? On we weren't days, actually because we, still- we were, no, we really weren't because we were, um, we were just in our own areas and actually it's love is like, or whatever you want to call that oxytocin that's released <laughs> in your brain when you fall in love. But like it was helping our work. So my companion and I were baptizing more than ever. The, so that gave the zone leaders more of an excuse because they would come to baptisms, you oh, know? Yeah. And so we were like baptizing more people and it was like the vibes were like there. And people are seeing like the light of Christ in they you, but are. it's really like you're just in love. We're, in the, we're all in love. Yeah. And we're all these like, like young. I want that. And it's not going to be found in this baptismal font. It's going to be found at, yeah. by just dating a hot Brazilian. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That lasted one transfer and then his companion got transferred to another area and it was like it was the most devastating because we went from this like we were all working and we were all like enjoying and then he's gone Mm -hmm. and the and then the guy who came in um the senior the senior elder was like he we all got kind of paranoid too because the guy that came in the senior elder was like he's here to like spy on us like they know what what's going on and this because he was an assistant to the president mm. and then he got transferred to this area so like he was like he got really paranoid so like the vibes changed the one guy's gone my companion's now heartbroken because essentially like her boyfriend just like left and she doesn't know when she'll ever see him again you know and i'm like um trying to like hold all this and that's when i had my first panic attack Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really brutal because then just all the shame and, you know, everything kind of like started coming to a head. It was like the honeymoon phase was over and like, now we have to like carry this, this kind of like lie that was one and a transfer is six weeks. So that was like for the next six weeks. And then her and I got transferred to different areas. Um, and then I think I had about like three more months on my mission and he, the the you know senior zone leaders we'll call him um would he would secretly call me in these other areas and he would send me these secret letters these love letters um that he would like get messages to me and like found all these ways to like you know feed me these mm-hmm. like love stories like and you were throughout. in it and I was in it. Oh, fully. Like I was like, oh yeah, like fully in love, you know, mm-hmm. or in love. Yeah. And so through the time that you guys did spend time together, mm-hmm. you said, just to clarify, like what were the, uh, some of the boundaries that you put up? You mentioned like, we won't have sex, but you were, were you guys like kissing, holding hands, cuddling? So Cause I know of a lot of people who just get sent home for just the most yeah. minor infractions. It's true. Yeah. So I'll never forget. It was on this one particular bus ride. So it was like just the four of us on a P day. We went to like go shopping or go to like a tourist area. Cause you could do that. Like on your P day, you could go on the hours that you're allowed to be out. You can do that. So the four of us like take a bus ride and, and we were like, well, I guess on this bus ride, like Cause you're never even supposed to sit by someone who's not your companion. You know, you're never supposed to be in a different room as your companion, but we're like on this bus ride, you know, we'll separate and, you know, we'll sit with our guys or whatever. So my companion is sitting next to her guy and then we're behind them. And, and I will never forget. We're just sitting there talking, you know, no hand holding, nothing like that. And I look over and they're holding hands. And I was like, And I mean, it sounds so silly because it's like holding hands, but like in that context, it's Mm -hmm. like serious. (laughs) Like this is such a like big rule that they're breaking. And like, we're now like stepping into a different territory from just like telling each other we're going to get married to like, okay, now we're making contact and like, and I remember, and I was like, and I like pointed to them and I was like, look, and you know, obviously as like a young guy, my guy is like, oh, well 
I'm not going to let this dude be like holding this chick. Like I need to make my move, you know? Sure. And so, so he's like, we we're just kind of making jokes and like, whatever, like laughing about it. And then, um, and then I think we end up holding hands or something. Um, and then on that same, and I think he, I mean, also like showing off or I, I who knows what was going through his head, but and he's like, I, I, you know, I, I really want to kiss you. And I was like, no, like I, that's just something that I, I just, I, I can't, you know, like I, I'm, it's a slippery slope. And he was like, didn't, did not, did not respect my no at all, at all. And just, you know, leaned in and just kissed me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. And, and it was really like, and I was saying no to, I was like, no, like don't and did. And yeah, you don't, you don't, we don't learn about consent as young Mormon girls. We don't, because ultimately it's like, well, we're just kind of here and like, it's whatever like he wants, I guess, like and all kind of, you know, or at least that's how I felt a lot of the times, mm -hmm. a lot of emotions at the same time. Cause I was obviously really horny too. So it was like, oh my God, you know, like on the one hand, but then like, wait, but I told him no, but like, oh uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so it was just that whole, I mean, it's nuanced, you know, but you mentioned like a lot of that you call it just trauma of um the person that came home early from their mission and you kind of promising that that was never going to be you and if somebody kisses you with when yes. you're saying no like you would get sent home yeah even though you said no even though i said no no thank you for bringing that up yeah and i and i told him that too i said before i told him no i said here's the reasons why, you know, and I told him about this person in my life. I told him oh, no. what it, why it was such a serious thing for me. And he didn't listen, you know, and he did what he wanted. And, and that really changed things because then I felt like I was kind of like trapped in this thing sort of. And so, um, and we had already like kissed. So it was like, okay. And then also it's all the hormones, everything. It's like, okay, woo, like everything mm -hmm. you've been repressing, like, woo. And so it just really like, you know, wigged out my chemicals too in my brain. And so we would see each other at like district meetings or zone lady zone meetings. And like, just looking at each other was like the hottest thing. <laughs> like to this day I'll probably like never experience like a steamy romance like that because it was just like so forbidden you know right. and and the shame there, there's so much tied into that and we would just like stare at each other and then like some I think maybe once or twice we would like you know sneak off to a, into a room and like kiss and there was always that trauma of like I had said no and it still happened and now I'm in this thing with him and you know it's that like Oh, but I, I'm, I don't know. It's complicated. And you then know? you have the hormones and stuff. But, yeah. That even your better judgment is oh. going to be bypassed. It's going to be bypassed. Yeah. You're, it's human. It's so human, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, that was that first transfer when we were all together. I think because of all of those really confusing feelings, um, it just made the rest of my mission really difficult. I was so determined to make that work. I think because I had broken all of those rules, it was like, well, this has to, we have to get married now. That And I was so serious about it. I told my parents, I emailed my parents. And I also think it was in a way, looking back at it, I think it was a cry for help too, but you don't know that in the moment. But I emailed my parents and said, hey, remember dad's blessing? I met my husband. Yeah, like full. And and my mom wrote back and was like, no, you didn't. My mom is like such a strong, like badass. She was like, you did not. No, you didn't. Like you are, Whoa. You, no, you didn't. She knows you're kind of in this container. She knew. <laughs> she. My mom is very wise and she knew. And she's like, uh-uh, no. And I was like, Ugh. and so it kind of started this thing between my mom and I, but like, looking back at it now, like my mom is just so in, like, she's my mom, you know, like she knew and she was protecting me. Like I'm her daughter, you know, and she, I'm sure she saw me just confused and, and she was doing her best. And I took it of course, as like a kid too. And you're 
in your own thing, you just, you just take it as like, oh, she doesn't understand. And she would never understand. My mom didn't go on a mission. She has no idea. Like, you know, she, she doesn't know what this is like. She just started having babies when she was 19. She doesn't know what I'm going through. She has no idea. But, um, so it kind of started this at that point, my mom and I, it, it created this like dissonance, you know? Um, and looking back at it, it's just like, it was full protection. Um, yeah, sorry. I just like yeah. never really like kind of had that full moment of like, that's what that was, you know, like it wasn't shame. She was scared for me and she was worried about me um, as she should have been. Um, it wasn't a safe situation. And and then my parents, they came and they came and picked me up because my dad, he served his mission in Brazil and he was like so thrilled that like you know, his daughter went to Brazil and, and they, and my mom, it was really special for my mom too, because of course, like, you know, growing up hearing about the place that your husband went on his mission and everything. So like my mom's there for the first time and, and my mission president and his wife are some of the loveliest people. And, and they, you know, met my parents and it was like really, really sweet. And I also wanted them to meet um, this elders own leader because I was going to marry this guy. And so I, I wanted them to meet him and I knew it would be an issue with my mom. And I said, I didn't care. And we all met one day. We all met and and my dad speaks Portuguese because um, his mission, but my mom didn't. So she didn't really understand what was going on. She also knew it was wrong. <laughs> She knew that like, uh, uh, and so she just, and my mom doesn't, she's not fake. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she just kind of sat there and is like polite, but like not into this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I took that as like, oh, she's shaming me and being mean and judging me. But I think really she knew there was some weird stuff going on there. Probably some manipulation. Probably she, she knew. I feel bad thinking back on that. There wasn't room for her to say much, you know, and and my dad was just like on this, like, oh, my blessing came through mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. a little bit and excited. Like he's and this guy is very charismatic. Um, That's very, what I was going to ask. Yes. Very um, funny. Very. Oh, yeah. Whole thing. Whole thing. Yeah. Um, very. So my dad's like, oh, he's a cool guy, you know, and I'm like, yeah, like dad's on my side. And and um, again, nuanced, a very nuanced situation. No one's right or wrong in this scenario. It's just like humans humaning in a very like weird context and, and um, complicated context sure. and specific. I come home from my mission and I am just wigged out. Like I know most people, when you get off your mission, you're wigged out. I was really wigged out because I had just lied to my president who I really respected you know, I had just carried this, like, what felt shameful. And I think it's tied back to my no, not being respected. You know, I was carrying all that with me and I come home and it just, it just really came out in unhealthy ways. And I was suicidal for the first time in my life. I had never experienced that, like real, you know, um, desire not to be here anymore and, and, and not even not to be here I was, I felt unworthy to be, I just felt like too bad to exist, yeah. you know, and that's a feeling that no one, no human should ever have to feel. And I know personally, I know people who have felt like that um, because of situations in the church and it's not okay at all. And, and I felt that and, and it was one night in particular and I was very serious about, you know, what I was going to do. And luckily my dad was there. My dad's an amazing person and um, he, he found me and he actually in that he, it's kind of like full circle moment because I, I think he just didn't know what else to do. And he like gave me a blessing. It was like in the middle of the night and it was like really dramatic and I needed to talk to him too. I needed to tell him about the no. I needed to tell him wow. like, Hey, I know this whole thing seems like, but, and I didn't tell my mom, I didn't, I didn't want to involve her in that depth of like, you know, we, we, it wasn't just this romance, like physical things happen. And, and, and I told him no. And it kept, and I told my dad that, and he, um, and my dad just, you know, such a, my dad's such a good man. And was just like, Oh my, like, you are okay. Like, you are, oh, it's okay. It's so okay. 
everything's fine, you know, and really lifted me up. And I was so raw. And I think it had only been like a few weeks since I had gotten home or something. And, and he really like saved me, like really helped me through that. And my parents were really there for me. And this whole time I was still in contact with this guy. And it was, he was kind of like now going back to his like fiance who he had been engaged to before. And it was this, and it was all getting really bad and really messy and really complicated. And, and I, I didn't know what else to do. So I, I was like, you know, they tell us that the temple can give us these, these answers. If we're really struggling, like we can go to the temple and get these answers. I'm going to the temple and ask, I need to ask what to do once and for all for with, in relation to this guy, do I stay with him? Cause he was, you know, still like moved down. Like we were, I was going to move to Brazil, you know, yeah. and, and marry this person. And he, at this point was still engaged, but he was, he no, it had broken off. Broken he broke off. it off on. So around the same time that I emailed my parents and told them he broke up with his oh. broke up. I mean, who knows, but, um, broke up. I At think he did. He actually. I think he did because he would share letters like okay. of her just being destroyed, you know, really sad actually. But, um, whatever, but, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, there was this like kind of back and forth going on. And then I, I was like, I need, I need to know for myself, you know, once and for all. So I was in Salt Lake, actually. Um, I went to the Salt Lake temple and I went alone and I just, the whole, my whole intention was like, tell me, like, let me know what to do about this guy and this situation. Like, do I, you know, was all that real? Like, what was that? And um, and I like go through the temple and it was, you know, I, I have different relationships and I've had different experiences over the years in the temple. But in this particular time, it was a real a, a place where I was able to feel like peace and and solace. And like and so I go there and I I'm it's at the end. I'm in the celestial room and I'm sitting alone and um, I, I mean, I'm I'm alone and there's this woman that's sitting next to me. And I hear her speaking Portuguese. And of course, like, you know, right after your mission, you're just like, oh, like, I was like, hi, I'm like, are, are you Brazilian? And she's like, yeah, I'm Brazilian. And we start speaking Portuguese. And, um, and, and she was like, you're so beautiful. Um, and I was like, oh, thank you. Like, thanks. She's like, she's like, you just went on a mission. And, and I was like, yeah, I did. And, and she was like, oh, like, you're, you're going to get married so quick. You know, how that's like the thing. It's like, you went on a mission. Wow. You're so pretty. Like, but she's like, especially back then, but she's like, she's like, you're so beautiful. Um, you're going to get married so quickly. Like, did you just get home? I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, you'll, you'll be married so quick. And it was kind of this like playful, like silly thing. And then it was like this serious thing, like washed over. And she looked at me and she was like, do not marry a Brazilian. It was like really, and this is again, nothing against the Brazilian people at all. But she looked at me and said, don't marry a Brazilian man. And I think in that moment, it was for me, it meant him specifically, you know, and that like hit me. She didn't know him. She didn't know anything about my life. Nothing. She's and she a looked at me. coincidence that. Yeah. And she looked at me dead in the eye and said that. And for whatever reason, her projecting her own whatever against me marrying a Brazilian man, it resonated with me in my particular, you know, experience and what I needed to hear. And, and for me, that was all I needed to hear. And it like, I don't know, it was very, very like helpful for me. And I was like, okay, I feel clear on this. I feel okay. And that day I broke up with him and that mm. was it. That was it. Um, yeah. And he married the other girl three months later. Oh my God. Yeah. So, um, that was, but I was so grateful for that woman. I, I, I'm grateful for that whole experience because I just like learned a lot. It's a really intense story. Um, and, um, it, probably to someone who like, hasn't gone on a mission, it's like, that is the most G rated, like whatever, but there's a lot of s deep symbols for women in mm. that, you know, and, and someone with the small, not only women, but like minorities, someone with the without the upper hand of symbols of like consent and, and the power dynamics and manipulation that is, it's really important to remember throughout like, you know, all of, all of life. Like, um, and, and I, I just really lost touch with my own authenticity, with my own voice. I didn't know what to trust for so long. 
you know, and, and it took me a few years to like actually stop going to church and really separate myself. And when I finally did, um, it was probably about three years later. Um, I, I, it was first of all, just like not going to church anymore was really helpful for me. And like, no longer, it was a long evolution, but, um, I, it, the moment that I really did decide, like, it's it's done was so relieving for me. And I think my parents had seen me struggle so much, like, mental health-wise, that they were like, whatever you need to do for you, um, you know, do that. Nice. It was nice. They were, yeah, I know they weren't thrilled, obviously. It's, like, what they believe in. and But they were, they always loved me and were always um, there for me. And then after leaving, I still found myself operating in the you know, system of Mormonism. Like I got married, even though I wasn't Mormon, I got married very quickly. Like it was very, um, to, you know, a guy who also served a mission and he was kind of going through his own exit. And we just like, Ooh, had, had to do that, had to get married. And then we got divorced. And, and after the divorce, I was like, you know, this is, this is really hard. If I have to go through life, like being out of this system, but still operating under that, um, that's gonna, that's just gonna be really difficult. And I don't want that. I really want to lead from my heart. I want to act in an authentic way. That's how I want to live my mm -hmm. life. And I heard about ayahuasca, which was like so, um, random kind of mm -hmm. because I was not into, I never really like smoked weed. I would kind of like drink here and there and like, but I, I wasn't into anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me ask you yeah. about the, I, I actually specifically sought out Natasha Helfer, um, to, who's a ex Mormon. She's been excommunicated from the church. And right, when we were planning, what we wanted to talk about was like, Natasha, how could we talk more about like how to know if you have, you know, sexual shame and just my phrasing of that. She's like, that you're adorable. We, uh, we pretty much, you know, we all do, but we don't really recognize it. And I'm like, that's something that, you know, I've come into my own of realizing over just like the past year and how much there is to deconstruct. We use that word so much that it's mm -hmm. kind of lost all its meaning, but like truly it's important, the things that you, you don't understand about consent, you don't understand, um, about just where you're kind of holding that shame that you carry with you into your post-Mormon life and still wondering why, that is still stuck on you, but you, you can't, you don't really know it until you go through some life experiences and you're like, oh, and there's, there it is. Or you do different, you know, uh, all kinds of therapeutic or mental health uh, yeah. tools. Psychedelics can be one of them yeah. to kind of be like, oh, there's that thing that I didn't right. see before where, where that shame was hiding. Yeah. And it's caused me to act out in this way when it's, it's like the whole leave the church, leave it alone. And people just want to leave the church and, and move on with their life without realizing there's this stickiness that yeah. will come up in really unhealthy ways. Yeah. So if you want to speak to more, I'm really interested to hear more about what you were talking about in um, the shame aspects of what you kind of felt like you were still holding from Mormonism that now you can reflect on. You're like, that that was still stuck to me. And that lesson, that idea about my worth, that idea of like outsourcing autonomy. Yeah, the, the shame piece. Um, I mean, I'm still working through that still. You know, I, I think we're all, you know, these like beautiful, like complicated little like juicy onions and we just have so many fucking layers. And like that is life is just like peeling them back and like, oof, got to feel that one now. And like, mm -hmm. ooh, didn't realize I was storing that one in there. And then like, ooh, that's from my ancestors. Cool. Got to feel that one. And it's like, we're so, we don't want to feel pain. I don't, you know, it's like the one human we we don't you know and um it also keeps us safe to run from pain and so it's very like biological to not but um i think there's just so so many layers of the shame and especially when when you make decisions and you act for years in in a mode of like um you don't know what you're doing you're brainwashed so then the layers become even even more interesting as you unpeel them and even more um, shocking too, because you, you know, it's a trip that was laid on you that you weren't really aware of happening. So when it, when these, when these layers are peeled back, that's a whole new learning. And so I'm still, I'm still very much like learning 
the the deconstruction and and the shame. I mean, you really I, I don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And and as far as I mean, for me, it was like I think it was just. I all I can say is like the the biggest um the most helpful thing and it was from from psychedelics the most helpful lesson and like reclaiming that I experienced after um my divorce everything was just this like real like coming back to to self you know and this real like bring it that you are like bring it the the medicines and and these tools just bring you to you you know they of course it, they make you feel like you've blasted out to to outer space and that's fun and that's that's cool and all but for me the real helpful um moments of those profound experiences are are knowing that it's here it's it's you and it always has been you it always will be you the power is here um and it's it's remembering you know like i love i always the the ramdas love love serve remember remember is remember your worth come back to it come back here you know and so i mean the shame like when you know when you know your worth um then the shame starts to it just appears as this symbol or something that is used in this reality, um, in my opinion, to people, systems put that on people. I don't, sure, yeah. sh I don't have shame anymore. You know, like, um, I don't, I don't think any, anymore. I don't, I don't believe that there's a part of me that's bad anymore, you know? And I look back on that and I just see like, fuck, like mm. that was, that was so, um, you know, a really like that manipulation tactic like works. Like shame is a really powerful one. And fuck anyone who who tries to shame someone to control them because that's not cool at all. You know, and and I'm so grateful, so grateful um for you know these these medicines and the the traditions and um the the people, the humble people that I sat with my first time, I always like walk around with this chakruna um, bark and it's, it's an ingredient that goes into the ayahuasca, but it's from the retreat center that I went to my first time in so Southeastern um, Peru. Yeah. With the Amaracai people um, and, and them really, you know, it, just such a different experience of, of community of, of women taking you in and saying, here's this medicine to bring you back to your own power and bring you back to like love, which is all you are. Like there's no shame in a human, you know, it's just like, that's put on you. Mm -hmm. Those are the layers that are like put on us, you know? And, and yeah, these, these medicines can be really, really profound tools to cut through that. And community is really essential in my opinion to, um, hold after those profound experiences. So that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that ideas that I think I resonate with too much. I wish I didn't resonate <laughs> with them so much, but it doesn't have to necessarily come from one tool or another because I'm not trying to push anything on anyone. It's, right. It's we'll get into a discussion about that, but like find the ways where you reconnect with yourself truly outside of these systems. And again, that that can literally be like a family system. Like yes. a cult of two of a like an interpersonal relationship or your relationship with um any kind of thing that just uh siphons away your true autonomy, mm -hmm. integrity, intuition mm -hmm. that tools like yeah. can really help you realign with. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me what are the insights then that you took away from yeah, those first those first experiences with mother ayahuasca and take me through how you kind of deconstructed all of that where you Ooh. leave the church, but there's still a whole other like Susie to grow into. Well, it was, it was really the, the ayahuasca experience that, um, that actually that was, that was the first, cause there was a specific, um, there was a specific ceremony where I, I quite literally felt like the chains of like, um, the church that had kind of had me bound. I, in like a physical and a visual way, I felt them breaking off of me. Um, and then I, um, purged for a very long time <laughs> after that immediately after I had that experience um and and yeah like it was the first time that I 
I just felt like, oh, like, it's just me. Like I, you know, and then that comes with its own like lessons and you have to like mess up and relearn. And cause you're experiencing like life in this new mode. Cause you're not like, um, it's like a fresh little baby or something that like comes out of, um, I don't know, it's mother maybe. And, um, yeah, you're so, so that was an interesting time. Like after, like in the, on the one hand, it was so profound in that, like, okay, now I'm this free agent and I can like, um, do what I want, but then you have to like learn and you, and, and that's always, that's just always, again, that's why it's important to go back to the remembering, remembering, because then you'll learn new lessons and that, but it's hard to like pinpoint like one thing, but I would say like, I went, that was my intention. Like I, I remember having a call with my teacher six months before I went down to Peru and she said, you know, okay, we're going to be going through this intense experience. What, do you hope to get out of this? And I told her, like, I, I just want to break free from that system. Um, and I don't want to operate from that anymore. And it, that it was successful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Set and setting and yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Other and things. that's, that's actually where that retreat center is where I met my now co-founder. Um, I, I co-founded the an organization were called the psychedelic assembly in new york city um and my my co-founder kat lakey she is the um the director of the space in new york and and but that's where we met we met in peru we met so that that experience really changed kind of the course of my life and really opened me up to um this whole different way of healing that was really helpful for me mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you about that is always important to reiterate and talk about whenever I get the chance is in addition to kind of healing and breaking out of the system, it's also something that I don't think ex-Mormons understand enough is how to properly like relate to their feelings and not mm. judge them, not put shame on them. Yeah. Whereas, like I mentioned with um, Stephanie Bringerhoff in our interview, um, also about a couple of similar themes uh, a couple of weeks ago that she was talking about how when you're in the church, like good feelings come from God and bad mm. feelings come from Satan. And so you cannot believe in those like literal entities, but you still feel like you, you don't know how to healthily relate to your feelings of mm. guilt, shame, um, you know, messing up, doing, doing things wrong. And uh, then being able to be in a space where you, you hold that for yourself and you can relate to your feelings instead of casting judgment on them mm -hmm. and kind of staying stuck in that negativity in mm -hmm. that place. Is that something that you felt like you were able to, to work through how to relate to your emotions? Yeah. Ayahuasca. I mean, ayahuasca is called vine of the death. She's a shadow worker. She takes you to the most uncomfortable and the most terrifying things that exist in your psyche. So that's where I learned like, the holistic nature of, of welcoming those things in. And when you're supported, I mean, they're just as, I, I also am very like, I'm on the Buddhist path now. So that informs um, my, my way of thinking now and my way of like existing, I would say now. So um, um, in, in the Buddhist lens, you know, like the duality, it's all the same shit. Like it's just material that we're working with here. Um, and and the good feelings, the bad feelings, the scary, the lovely, the romantic, the, it's all just different sides of the same coin. So that first profound, I had, I was, I had to confront suicide. I had to confront some really like terrifying feelings and, um, and experiences that I was not expecting. That's another reason I'm like, be careful with who you sit with and that stuff. Make sure you trust a person because you want someone who's able to, um, help you through those experiences and help you learn from them versus, um, them just being a really fucking scary, yeah. bad trip. You know, one thing that is, you know, seems a little bit of a, a paradox to maybe our like formerly Mormon minds mm -hmm. is the idea of going into those dark places. Yeah. Because like I mentioned, like that darkness, that feeling that is so much can just be associated with like satanic things mm -hmm. when um, shadow work for me, my friends, my husband, especially mm -hmm. um, has been super beneficial yeah. and confronting those things that we kind of don't want to talk about in the holding yeah. space for them. So I yeah. wanted to ask if you want to expand any more about like the benefits of that type of shadow work and what it is for listeners. I mean, the benefit is just that like, oh, you're just going to be so much lighter. If, if you do it 
with someone that is that is um you know so like if you're if you're sitting with someone who's able to again support you you're seeing again like the the psychedelic it just means mind manifesting so these bad they as an ex-mormon too like you're probably if you've had a traumatic um upbringing or whatever if you've gone through you're probably going to go to those places so be prepared you know because it's it's just mm-hmm. it's mind manifesting it's mm-hmm. again it's just elevating what's already there um in my opinion it's a really great thing to do if you if you want to live like an authentic life because if if you're just ignoring those things because they're just on the subconscious you don't know it's happening um you're again you're just going to keep operating those modes so like seeing them for almost just looking at them and examining and and just um like oh i mean it it takes it takes (laughs) a lot of a lot of um bravery i think to to choose to go there but i i for me it's extremely helpful to mm-hmm. to see those and understand that like no that's not me those um images those um those histories or you know that's not i am love like who i am but these things exist in my brain these these are these are this is material that i'm working with in this incarnation so let's be with it it wants to be seen it wants to reveal itself so let's let's let it it's been so critical like for just like moving forward in life and and um, feeling confident in decision making and um is really like doing the shadow work and looking at it and and it's it's really not easy it's not glamorous too no like i mean um yeah, I was thinking that when I was like blowing the tobacco up my nose before this interview, which is another like little um shamanic practice I picked up in the jungle, but um this stuff isn't romantic. It's not it's hard. Like it's just like it's just like work like anything it's else. It's a lot of sobbing. It's a lot of puking. Right. It's a lot of like, you know, yeah, going into the darkest places and seeing yeah. what comes up or else you for me at least, um I haven't done ayahuasca for example, but um really wanting to be um, as in tune as I can, because I just want to be in the right kind of flow that serves my mental health, my family, my community the best. And if I'm acting unconsciously and I am uh, motivated by an engine of gasoline that I haven't checked is like expired (laughs) and it's filled with like old gas in a tank that's, you know, 40 years old and it's still trying to chug me along and uh, you're going to be driving different places right you you in breaking down i guess is another way to put it you know and so um for for example i'd love if you had any examples but if it's too personal you don't have to share but um a friend of mine that did ayahuasca and the experience was hard you know it's Mm -hmm. like you said it's not glamorous it was the the darkest time but she's Mm -hmm. so glad she did it and she talked about how her biggest fear that was kind of manifested was like seeing her child who was like had special needs and like crying and really uh, coming face to face with how deeply they are hurt by mm. having like a special needs child and how yeah. difficult they um, they haven't processed that because you just want to be yeah. tough and you just want to yeah. be like I can do this you know yeah. and then you worry about like how long am I going to take care of them when they're yeah. older and you don't want to think those thoughts sometimes of but like those things coming up can kind of hold resentment mm-hmm. that will manifest in other ways of course. until you confront those types of things and mm-hmm. she said it was scary as fuck though you know you don't want to think any small part negative more negatively it's not it's not popular to say that like i went into the deepest parts of myself and i realized i didn't want to be a mom or i didn't want to be married to this person or whatever but then where where are you going to be breaking down in other areas if you don't confront it absolutely absolutely i also think you know i think healing can you know i don't i don't want to harp too much on like it's so hard and can be so Cause it can also be really fun. It can also healing can look like, in my opinion, because I've experienced it can look like taking MDMA and dancing and connecting with your friends, you know, and experiencing love with people through music. It, it can, it can, healing can happen in all sorts of ways. That's why the biggest, I hope the biggest takeaway from this, like, don't listen to me. Don't listen to Kara listen to yourself, you know, and, and healing for you can look like taking a bath. Healing can look look like so many different things yeah and we have so many different lives we have so many different journeys and circumstances here on this planet people are in a lot of different modes and i cannot speak to any other mode other than my own 
you know? So for me, that's been, it's been helpful, but please listen, listen to your own voice and do those subtle, you know, practices that, that bring you back to that, whatever Mm -hmm. that may be in, in subtle ways. That's why at the psychedelic assembly, you know, we, we are a community center. We're a a member supported library and social club in Manhattan. And we believe that psychedelics do have this great healing potential, but we believe the real power and, and our focus is, is human connection um, and, and connection to oneself. So we're really about like facilitating, facilitating spaces and, and creating spaces for people who are on um, whatever, whatever healing path you may be on, it could have nothing mm-hmm. to do with psychedelics. Um, so yeah, because that's those very like psychedelic of you to say, which is like <laughs> the, the phrase of just, yeah, I don't know your journey of no. where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do. Mm-mm. But like a couple pillars that I would hope people come back to is yeah, looking at where they have outsourced this autonomy and, mm-hmm. and separated themselves and are not just connecting with themselves and others in ways that I feel like mm-hmm. our human intuition calls us into mm-hmm. exactly. and that can come. And for some people, literally that comes through the religion that they're in. Yeah. And I can have a whole freaking heap of problems, but you know, there's, there is a bajillion different nuanced circumstances Absolutely, that everyone's got to figure out. And yeah. I can't tell you how much I get, you know, DMs and asks Uh, by people like I have a younger sister who's getting married in the temple and she's Mm. so young or this my little brother's serving a mission um I was telling you that my nephew just left on his mission today just said Mm. goodbye to him and I don't know if he knows who I am or what I do and when people ask me you know because they're heartbroken like you know there's part of me my nephew's leaving and like there's a million things you want to say to him and of course like you know part of your family and when you care about people and so so many so many people reach out to me and they want like some like should I like send him a CES letter should I do this and stuff yeah and I'm like not only just the the backfire effect work on people I was like uh, at the end of the day people are on their journey like, I got married really young you know there's all those experiences and here, and here you are and like you're mentioning on your mission you know it's like it's hard to to just listen to your mom when they're warning you. It's like there's freaking experiences you have to go through where everyone could be um, blasting blaring lights in your face. Doesn't matter. But it, yeah, but it doesn't matter because like for Susie's journey, that's what you yeah. needed to experience. That's what each of us need yeah. to experience. But like I mentioned, if there's if there's actual harm being done, please yes advocate for reducing harm. Of course. Yeah. But yeah. it's really hard to speak into other people's experiences yeah. and what's actually right for them. So yeah. thank you. Well, I was just going to say thank you for like speaking so eloquently to like the nuances of being human too. And I, I feel like I'm so grateful for everything I've experienced, for everything that has, it's so cliche, but like I I, I really am because um, I mean, now I'm I'm at a point where I just I'm really into like celebrating humanity. Like I don't really care about what you're doing, what substance you're taking, how you're healing. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Let me know if you need resources or something, but like I am, I'm here to, you know, um, hold, hold space for human celebration. Truly. I'm here for gathering people and celebrating the humanity of it all because that's fucking psychedelic like i don't care about the substances that people are taking or how they're blasting their brains off whatever if you can be with someone who looks nothing like you and learn something from them and listen if you can just shut it and listen to someone's story and tell have them tell you the most like horrifying thing that's happened and you hold space for that and just be there for it like if we can do that with each other that's what's going to like change. It's not drugs. It's not plant medicine. It's not, hopefully those things help. It's not religion. You know, it's, it's us coming together. And I I really believe that, like, that's something I'm um, very serious about is these divides that um, oftentimes we're putting up ourselves um, through, through many different modes. If we can just really, really focus on, you know, dissolving those and coming together, I mean, um, the Beatles always knew come Mm -hmm. together. (laughs) Like it's, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's powerful. It's, um, it's the only thing in my opinion. So that's at the psychedelic assembly. That's what we're all about. 
Um, I'll share some resources too of just like safe practices and finding community as well. Cause there's some like, especially for us, like, um, you know, ex cult babies, like there's some red flags that you can That's look I, out for. I exactly. Too. wanted to ask you yeah. as well is things to look out for. And in addition, um, if there's, I mean, people ask me all the time and I'm like, one, it's pretty much illegal in our state. So I couldn't tell you. And if I knew, Right. And, and I won't, I don't do that. Yeah. yeah. So, and then again, um, is there places where people can find the type of community that you've built in New York around? Oh, yes, there is actually, um, Psych psychedelic society of Utah here, um, run by a really great guy. I believe his name is Craig. And, um, I believe there's like a mycology, there's a mycological society, of Utah. So all things mushrooms. There's also a really incredible mushroom festival that's going to be happening for the second time ever. It'll be happening in September. So mark your calendars for that. Um, and that's going to be a really incredible place to meet people, find resources. Um, and yeah, I would just say, I'll like, make sure to link all of that. So yeah. You don't have to write it all down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to get those links so people can yeah. go and tap into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, the, the, the big vision, I mean, I mean, we hope to just, you know, make these communities and resources more available to the public. Um, so people can tap in wherever you are. So. Yeah. And divine assembly yes. in Salt Lake, mm -hmm. mushroom sacrament. So I've done some, uh, different speaking things with them and they helped host this big event that brought out Paul Stamets with um, mm -hmm. this past the couple weeks ago. Um, just incredible people, mm -hmm. just so loving and nurturing. And there's nothing like really feeling like um, you find a good post-Mormon family. And yeah. there's just so many beautiful people in that mm -hmm. space, but everyone can find their own of what they're, they're into and find the right kind of people that take them on the journey that mm -hmm. they will hopefully heal and, and grow from. Yes. Community, community is very important. Yeah. So back to some of the the red flags for cult babies yeah. like us to kind of yeah um, i am going to share the advice from experts in the show notes i'm going to share them with you and then you can put them up there because yeah. there are really incredible resources when um you know finding someone to sit with for these profound experiences finding community etc there's there's a lot of great resources um, that come from experts and i'm not an expert on this stuff. Um, but from my own experience, um, and I've had to learn some other lessons too, with, uh, yoga teachers, with, uh, in different Those areas, damn yoga teachers, oh, <laughs> always yoga teacher. <laughs> yeah. Um, love but yoga. yeah, yeah. I love yoga do it's, uh, yeah. So, so for me, red flags to look out for, um, any time anyone for me, it's like, okay, you're your own guru, just follow yourself. But obviously that is a lot harder to get to that point and it comes in phases. So like um, when you are joining community or coming in, be very careful if there is one person that everyone is listening to and if there is one kind of authoritative person giving advice for the whole group, um, look out for that, uh, you know, male or female, just, just look out for that. And, um, not to say that because, because we need to learn, you know, there's important lessons to be learned from wise elders and, and there's honor and respect to be paid to experience and, but be careful of who you're giving that to. Um, if, if at any point there's, you know, a moment of like, um, them making you feel like you don't making you feel like your experience isn't valid. Um, I would say run for the Hills. <laughs> don't waste another minute with the person. Um, other, other red flags. I mean, anything that just doesn't feel helpful, like it's really simple, but like, you know, anything that just doesn't feel like oh, that didn't actually like, that wasn't like helpful, but like, here I am still like, and I'm still doing this thing with this person or this group. No, if it's not helpful to you and like making you happy and making you feel clearer, if it's confusing, don't, don't just, mm -hmm. you know, um, we think we're kind of trained to be on a hamster wheel, like you yeah, said, following somebody else's absolutely. authority. And we are so hungry for like, give me the right answers. Of course. What do I need? 
to, that's all you know. I feel like that's so you know it's just human nature it's totally. all we all want are the answers and no one has them no one has them you know I think they're for me I've just found different um spiritual leaders who have and, and thought leaders who have helped me you know like Ram Das has been so that's a very helpful Tara Brock like there's certain teachers um you know, my my teacher who I studied with, um, Ethan Nickturn from Dharma Moon, like um, Buddhist studies, you know, there's different things that have been very helpful for me. Um, and I would say follow that. Anything that feels expansive, anything that feels, um, you know, soft and loving, follow that. Because ultimately, these good teachers are bringing you back to you. That's shamanism, you know, it's just like, all right, let's direct this energy right back to the love that is you. And, and if, if, um, someone can do that for you, awesome. Um, if, if that feels like it's being manipulated or, or they're, you know, toying with that for their own personal gain, run, don't waste your time. But, um, yeah. And, and remembering that like, we're all, we've all got the answers all the time. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can hear somebody in the audience saying like, you know, we're all still figuring it out. And then Susie says, and then we all, you know, have the answers within. And I know that sounds like a contradiction. I think that's the number one most beautiful paradox that would like, it's something to lean into is that type of paradox. But sometimes the answers are so deep within and they're so covered by all these layers that, and these conditions that have been put on us because that is what life is, you know, of us like unlearning, like um, it's like Ram Dass's whole thing. Like, I, you know, he remembering and, and learning that I'm nothing or coming back to nothing. I forget the exact, um, wording that he uses, but uh, becoming nothing, becoming no one, you know? And so that takes a lot of work because like in this reality, obviously we have to, you know, build up these personas, and these jobs and these, and this is how we get through the world. But, you know, doing whatever, those little practices, yoga, meditate, I mean, meditation, that's really the thing. Mm -hmm. Like that's the thing. If you can, if you can sit and and try to just i mean just breath uh, uh, even for 2 minutes a day you're that's remembering you're coming back to you're coming back in you know and and that's i mean yeah meditation would be i'm not a great meditator i that's the hardest part <laughs> the buddhas i mean it's a really interesting path to study mm -hmm. and and really fascinating to me and meditation is the hardest thing in the world mm -hmm. it's way easier to like well, I don't know. Taking mushrooms, can, the older I get, is harder too. Because I'm like, all right, going back in. But um, yeah, yeah, small bits of meditation coming back too. That's breaking through the layers as well. So, one of the final questions that I wanted to ask you. So, you know, it's interesting about when people are in interviews and they will say like, "What would you tell your younger self?" This or that, mm -hmm. and like. Well, those are always interesting and I love those kinds of things. And I think they could be really healing. I had an interview with Stephen Hassan, the cult expert, and he has this whole amazing thing that he had me and my friend Kyle go on with him of like, what do you wish you would have done when you were in the temple? You know, mm -hmm. I wish I would have stood up and said, I'm getting the fuck out of here kind of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. giving yourself back the power mentally that you didn't have at the time. But then again, like with what you were just saying, it's like, you know, you needed to learn that lesson. I've had lessons that I've needed to learn in this mm -hmm. way. And so in one sense, I want to ask you, like, what would you tell Susie who was, you know, on your mission and going through those types of experiences with the way that you understand the instincts that you were denying within mm -hmm. yourself and what you're trying to do? And like, what kind of, because there's people who are in the audience listening who are all in that space and they don't realize they're in that space mm -hmm. who are like, so if you at all want to bring it all together um, with how you would talk to people who are still in that type of mindset that you were yeah, in. Yeah, if I were if I were to go back to younger self, I think I think I would just like hold myself. I think like that's I would just hold and say it's okay. Like I would just like cry, <laughs> let it out. It's okay. Make mistakes. Fuck up. It's fine. It's so fine. It's so so fine. The thing that isn't fine is when you don't have that you know, home or self nurturing or, or self compassion. That's when it's not fine. But yeah, like, it feels frantic. Exactly. The, the actual actions of messing up and going on a mission and 
dating the dude, boo, boo, boo. it's like, okay, that's just called human life. Like we all have our own version of that same story. But like, I think the, the, the really sad and like, you know, the piece where like, you may get to points where you feel like you're not worthy to be here is if you don't have that self compassion and that like self nurturing and self love and just real acceptance. So I would, I would just accept everything, um, you know, and, and go through it, but just hopefully with like a, a bit more compassion to myself and, and to my experience. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i'm still really working on that too really? mm -hmm. it's really I, i'm really mean to myself <laughs> yeah it's it's really it's like my yeah just really mm -hmm. trying to take care nurture myself be i'm very much yeah still mm -hmm. still on that path mm -hmm. yeah that's what i'm always for is one yeah kind of like that reparenting and mm -hmm. the holding space for yourself when no one else will yeah. so many things of aspects with the church systemically and um, family systems and missions and people, priesthood leaders or whoever who have, you know, inflicted bosses, harm, all yeah, of that. It just shows it, up. Yeah. yeah, it shows up in so many different systems and ways that people journey through life and knowing that like those apologies will never come and right. that, that system will probably never change. <laughs> and so how to separate yourself from that. And the only person showing up for you is going to be you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope people can kind of take what they need to from this story. So thank you for Aww. sharing and getting into all thank those you. details. And thank you. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. Thanks for holding space for it. Of course. Yeah. It's big reveal. <laughs> yeah. I was surprised because I didn't know exactly what we were going to talk about today. We didn't. And like we talked last night and we didn't know. So. Yeah. So thank you for, um, one, it's, it's always just brave. And I think, you know, we just want to be able to tell stories about our life and hope that by sharing it, like you feel a lighter burden and people listening who've gone through similar things can feel that as well and identify in your story. And yeah, that's kind of what I loved about, you know, working at Mormon Story. So yeah, so grateful to have you on to thank you. do the same type of thing that I used thank to do you. and, and reach out kind of also if, you know, I, like I said, I co-founded the Psychedelic Assembly. We are a community center. We have digital memberships we are um we are launching hopefully this year in the next six months we'll be launching um some online integration so please reach out to me personally too you can find my um, work email if you have any questions or comments so nice, yeah. or need resources um like i said at the beginning of this episode like i just um anyone who's experienced something similar um to feel more seen and and held in this you're not alone mm -hmm. it's okay if you have been a stranger to the subscribe button make that something that is no longer an issue you and the like button could possibly be best friends and ride into the sunset possibly all the way over to maybe my patreon patreon.com slash nuance ho and that's where it's free right now and i have um all of these videos are ad free on my patreon and we do live streams and a bunch of other fun stuff coming up you can join this channel to uh just get extra cool perks and help support this keep it sustainable i'm a 501c3 nonprofit now so Ooh. all donations are tax deductible in Hell the yeah. united oh. states you oh. know how hard it is to start a business and we do we do, we do hard things around here yeah <laughs> so Fuck yeah Women unite as well. I sorry, that's the last thing I want to throw in there. Do it. Ladies support ladies and women find each other and be friends with each other. Please, like we are so strong and we need sisterhood. And that's I need I that was something I didn't get in there. Um, women support women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like this. <laughs> yes, yes. Supporting support each, each other. other. We have so many things in common when we break down all the different barriers that keep us stuck in our places. So I absolutely could not do this without the donors and people who support all of this diverse offering. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Mormon History Hoedown with me, Cara Burrell, the Nuance Ho. Thank you so much, Susie, for joining me on this. Thank you. It's been so delightful. Yeah. All right. Love you guys so much. Bye. Bye.